Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first event in our Amplifying Black Voices series. Um, sorry, we have a bit of a delay on my end. Heather, can you hear me now? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay, perfect. Um, uh, so I'm going to be uh, doing a lot of this co-hosting along with our department chair, Heather Elliott Famolaro. Um, and Heather is not only our department chair, but an incredibly talented award-winning documentary filmmaker and artist active in the fields of broadcast television, computer graphics, and interactive multimedia with a focus on collaborative digital humanities and public education through digital media. She has presented as well as published and exhibited her work internationally in Canada, Hungary, Italy, and Poland, as well as at IDMA and SIGGRAPH, where she has also acted as curator and juror of numerous exhibitions. She is currently the head of the Digital Media and Design Department and the Donna Kronicki Professor of Design and Digital Media and is affiliated faculty in Judaic Studies at UConn. So I'm gonna let Heather take it away from here. Thanks, Nikki. Uh, welcome to Jorgensen Digital Stage at the first event for Ampli Amplifying Black Voices in Hollywood, our inaugural event for the Diverse Perspectives in Digital Media and Design 2021 speaker series. To paraphrase James Baldwin, nothing can be changed until it is faced. This is certainly true of the inequities that have historically shaped the entertainment industry, both on screen and behind the scenes. We're halfway through Black History Month, and today's summit appropriately features conversation with Black leaders from various sectors of the film industry, and will examine its changing landscape by exploring efforts to increase diversity in all aspects of Hollywood, from screenwriting to development and production, producing and directing, and visual effects and post-production. This summit is brought to you by UConn's Department of Digital Media Design, in partnership with Jorgensen Center for the Performing Arts and the H. Fred Simmons African American Cultural Center. We would like to begin today's event by acknowledging that the land which we typically, get, typically gather on here in Connecticut is in the territory of the Mohegan, Manchatucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Scaticoke, Golden Hill Pagoset, Nipmunk, and Lenape peoples who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. We thank them for their strength and resilience in protecting this land and aspire to uphold our responsibilities according to their example. Digital Media and Design is a young department founded in 2013, which has been rapidly grown to over 350 undergraduate and graduate students and 25 full-time faculty. We have seven undergraduate concentrations across the full digital media spectrum film production, animation, interactivity, business, and the humanities at both the stores and Stanford campuses. In our department, we value and celebrate our students' diverse backgrounds, and we support their development, both as individuals as and as professional media creators. This Diverse Perspectives in Digital Media and Design Speaker Series is one celebration of these shared values. Tonight's event will feature an hour of conversation, including questions from our virtual audience. Please take advantage of the YouTube chat box to submit questions for our guests, which we will try to answer during the discussion. Now on to the show. It is my extreme pleasure to welcome today's special guest, uh, Numa Perrier, who is going to share her insight and experiences in small screen, big impact, creating content for underrepresented voices in digital media. And it's also my pleasure to um, introduce today's co-host, uh, who's gonna join me in this conversation with Numa, uh, Mr. Isaiah Edwards. Isaiah is a senior digital media and design student finishing his BFA in digital media video production with a minor in Africana studies. Isaiah has been very active in the Yukon community serving as the historian for Brothers Reaching Art Society or BROS, chief marketing officer for Yukon student television station, UCTV, and he's co-founder of the new student group Designed Black, which is a collective of black creatives. And Isaiah, you had the chance to meet Numa once at South by Southwest at Jezebel's premiere in 2019. So you are the perfect person to join in this great discussion today. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here. I'm really nervous, but I'm hyped. <laughs> of course. Um, and today's special guest is Numa Perrier. Born in Haiti and raised in small town USA, Numa has emerged as an exciting voice in the film television landscape. Her early work includes starring in and writing the hit web series, The Couple, which scored a deal at HBO. 
She co-founded the pioneering streaming platform, Black and Sexy TV, serving as creator, director, and showrunner on over a dozen series, including Rumi Lover Friends, produced by Isare, and Hello Cupid, co-created with Lena Waithe. She then moved on to her feature film de directorial debut, Jezebel, which premiered at South by Southwest 2019 and is distributed on Netflix via Abba DuVernay's Array Releasing. Numi is the recipient of Best Feature and Best Director Awards at the American Black Film Festival, is a Route 100 alumni, and is also counted as one of an all-American directing team on Queen Sugar. Numa recently signed on to her, direct, her, studio, her first studio film, The Perfect Find with Netflix, starring Gabriel Union. In front of the camera, Numa, Numa recurred as a guest star on Showtime's irreverent comedy Smilf in a critically acclaimed story arc about immigrants. Numa is currently starring in the surreal thriller Fuzzy Head alongside Rain Phoenix and is in development on numerous proje projects, including Toxic, an erotic thriller series and her follow-up feature Blood Mother via her boutique production arm, House of Numa. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, thank you so much. So let's start off, for those who may not have seen the film, but you must see it on Netflix if you get the chance, it's phenomenal. Let's go ahead and show that trailer, Mike, if you can pull that up. Yes? Um, hi, I'm here about the ad in the paper. What's your name? Tiffany. What's your real name? Internet models, nudity required, great pay. Your name? Tiffany. Just show off a little bit. You make money, you can do what you want to do. And then I can stay here? You can do what you want. Most of the girls don't even last a month here. You got her doing that nasty stuff now too? <laughs> they don't stick these on people's doors who pay the rent. Well, maybe if you work sometime, it will be paid. Get in trouble for this? Yes, I, um, so I got to actually see Jezebel at your premiere in South by Southwest. And let me just say that was like life changing for me personally, just to see, I don't know, black directors just doing their thing. And, you know, you're also a really cool person. So like your film was just really powerful for me and like it really changed my life. So for that, I'd like to say thank you. Um, thank you for that. But I would like to start into the first question for, the, um, for today. So right after I met you in South by Southwest, like that must have been like, a high for you and a moment. Um, so for that, I would like to ask, how did your career shift like right after creating Jezebel, um, especially getting global recognition? Well, uh, that was a really great premiere at South By. That was definitely one of the best ways to view, to view the film with a completely sold out, you know, overflowing audience and, you know, just all of the excitement that went into that. I remember uh, sitting in the very back of the theater, just completely sweating because <laughs> it was warm, but because I was just so nervous and I had so much anxiety leading up to the premiere, just you know, how will it be received? And will there be any technical difficulties up on the screen? And is everyone gonna get in the way they need to get in? You know, just all, you know, what are the reviewers gonna say and all of that? Because that's all everyone who's in the audience, you've got the press there as well. So uh, was a really big moment. Definitely um, my career changed drastically. Uh, Although I had been working for years and spent almost every day <laughs> of my adult life in some form of production, um, having a feature film 
on a platform as large as South by Southwest just opened me up to people who had never heard of me before or had heard of me within the context of Black and Sexy TV, but didn't know my individual story or didn't know my individual signature as a filmmaker. So taking that leap to make a feature film where the buck stopped at me uh, definitely put me in rooms that I hadn't been in before and introduced the world to what I care about, what my sensibilities are and who I am as a person. Um, so yeah, you know, from there things have really taken off and I'm moving into directing my first studio feature for Netflix, which is really exciting. But yeah, South by Southwest is such a great platform to introduce yourself to the world as a filmmaker. So very grateful to have been uh, selected when we were. Awesome. Uh, I like to go to the next question. Um, and going back to uh, how you got started in filmmaking uh, or storytelling in general, uh, why did you decide uh, to tell the stories that you did? And I know like, and you're in the, the movie Jezebel, it's like very personal to your own life. So um, yeah, if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I've, um, you know, I was not born in this country, but definitely raised in this country. So yeah, I was born in Haiti and I was um, raised in very, very small towns, but I was adopted. I was adopted by an American family. So from early childhood, I've always been trying to just make sense of my life, um, answer questions that are still unanswered for me, try to understand my culture, things that I feel run through my blood, but I didn't have words to put on them. And so from a very young age, I, I was always writing and trying to not only process those things, but also a form of escapism in using my imagination to tell stories that I wish I could be in, mostly romances, you know, I've always been like, had a lot of romantic notions since I was very young. So I would write these romantic novels and I wanted to be an actress on soap operas and all of it started from a very young age. So it was this mix of trying to understand myself, understand this very fragmented family life um, and wanting to also escape some of those realities. So as time went on, that writing and love for acting and love for images formed into me making my first short film. Once I made my first short film and I started learning on the job, what it was like to go through all of the steps of making a film from writing the script to showing it to your friends and all the steps in between, I really fell in love with that process. And I haven't stopped since. Uh, but my work will always come from a personal place. Even if I don't write the script, I'm always looking for a way in that matters to me personally, that echoes something that I'm trying to solve for myself personally. That's what drives me. And that's why you get the kind of stories that you'll get from me. Um. So thinking about that, so you're, you know, I, I want to move forward to all the exciting new things that you have coming up, but just a little bit of context. So, you know, thinking about the work, kind of work that you did prior to Jezebel, your first feature film, you know, what kind of projects, how did you sort of ease in? You said you made that first short and then was it a cascading effect of just wanting to do all kinds of, uh, of film based work? Yeah, it was really, um, I was in an acting class when I first moved out to LA. And at the time I didn't know that I was going to be a filmmaker, but I knew I loved photography. I knew I was a writer. I knew I loved acting. I loved the theater and I loved movies. <laughs> um, but in my acting class, there were maybe 50 people in class and about five or six were directors. So those directors would also direct the actors and put work up on the stage. And our teacher would give them an, an assessment after their scene. And I just noticed that their, I just loved how they talked about how they broke down a scene. And I would notice how the actors on stage with a director, 
the scenes were different than just us getting up there on our own and trying to kind of direct ourselves and learn this method of acting. So that was really my, my first kind of curiosity and catching of the bug because although I was interested in movies, I didn't know how, how they were made. I didn't really know what a director was or what a director did. And I certainly didn't have any, any images or example of anyone even remotely like me that would do even do something like that. So it was kind of this side entrance that I had to it in being an actress sitting there and just being so fascinated with how a director puts a scene together and then a movie together and it just lit me up because in directing, you get to touch on all of those pieces of art. You get to touch on the script. You get to touch on the wardrobe. You get to touch on the music. You get to just be so involved with so many different aspects of expression that for me, that there was kind of no turning back. It just clicked. Everything made sense from that point on. Wow. Yeah, yeah thank you, Fina. I'll go ahead. I always feel like some of the best directors are ones that started out as actors and really understand that process and how to communicate effectively with actors. And I feel like that really shows in your work. Thank you. I feel the same way. I do, you know, and I'm so excited about Regina King right now. And she's actually been directing for a long time. You know, her One Night in Miami is not, you know, her first time, you know, directing actors. But, you know, too, you can see in that film how she was able to really get in there with the actors who are already incredible, but because they speak the same language and we understand the way that we move through the cycles of basically duplicating humanity, you know, whether it's based on an, a, an actual person that lived before us or not, um, that's what we're doing where we're finding a way to strip down the bones of like what the mechanism of being a person, <laughs> being a human being, and then, relating to that and communicating that through a screen is really a gift. <laughs> so um, so I definitely have to agree that that there's an there's definitely an advantage there, but for me there's just an extra joy in that. So would yeah, you say, is your your favorite part then of the process? I mean you you've got your fingers in all of the different you know aspects. Do you have one? I mean, do you love the writing? Do you love the if you had to pick one? What's your? Uh, you know, I don't do the you have to pick one thing okay. anymore. I understand that. I do understand that question. Um, but it kind of like echoes back to my parents in a weird way of just like focus on one thing. And <laughs> not even that they were the ones giving me that um, idea as much, but um, it's a process, you know. And that, again, that's why I really love the filmmaking. And I love being in films that I make as well because you just get to be part of all those processes. So when you're in the script writing part of it, that's that's what you're in. And you're in, you know, how do you release all of these emotions and feelings that you have into something articulate enough for someone else to interpret, you know? And then when you move into, you know, the pre-production phase, it's all about you gathering your tribe, the people that are gonna collaborate with you on this thing and seeing how your sensibilities line up and where they can challenge you and where you can challenge them. And then you get on set and set is my favorite place to be. So to answer, if I gotta pick one thing I like out of the process, it's actually being on set. Um, you know, because you're really in the thick of it and being in the edit is, is a um, very close second favorite to that. I love, I call editing creative surgery because you get to take all of this incredible footage and then you get to really go in and almost recreate everything in a way. And so that keeps the process very exciting for me, but I love all of it. I'm as much of an actor as I am a director, as I am a writer. Um, and that's just been from an early age. Thank you I didn't for that. Know it was called directing. <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing was called directing. I didn't know, I yeah. didn't have someone to tell me to spot that in me and say, oh, you should, you know, direct films or direct yeah. plays or whatever. I didn't have that. I didn't, I didn't have that. I had to find that for myself, but it was always there. 
And just going off of that, you talked a little bit about just like Regina King, just um, and, and like her like current work. Are there different? Uh, it doesn't have to be like directly, but are there different mentors um, or like people you look up to and um, specifically acting or directing or uh, uh, if you have any mentors right now that you, you know, that really inspire you? Um, <laughs> I'm actually on the flip side of that where I have a few mentees now. I kind of stepped okay. into, I stepped into doing that, um, which is such a cool process. I do have I would say I have um, kind of my experience with having mentors isn't as formal or official. Like I don't have a person where I can say that's my mentor. I, and I kind of wish I did sometimes, but really I think that um, again, from a young age, I had a lot of kind of like issues with parents, like with the whole adoption thing that like having a mentor was always it was always just like a weird rub of like, who's my parent? Who's guiding me? Who's, you know, who's helping me along this path? Um, so I'm trying to be that for other people um, who, who feel that I have something that I can share with them. But my mentors, I have a few women in my life um, who I can go to. It's just hard for me sometimes to do that. Um, but if I do go to them with, hey, I'm at a crossroads in this thing, or hey, I, can you shed some light on this? Do you think I'm making the right move? They will advise me on that. And I think, you know, that's important because you can just feel so, so lost and lonely in this thing sometimes. Gotcha. And like, do, do, going off of that, I know this, you know, we'll go back to judgment, but, but um, do you feel like you also need, like, like you talked a little bit about a mentor for like, maybe just life in general too, like, is that helpful? Um, it, like, does that like help your experience with filmmaking? Yes, I think, yeah. I think so. I think it would, you know, I, and I think it does when I am able to reach out and make those calls. And it's just funny that you're asking about that because just very, very recently, you know, within the last 24 hours, I had, you know, a pretty major um, situation, you know, come up for me professionally and would have been great to like have that person to be able to kind of guide me through what was going on and, mm -hmm. and or, you know, remind me to take a step back from it for a minute before I make any rash decisions or anything, you know? Um, so it's interesting that, that you're asking about that. I think that, that it is important to have that person or group of people. Um, I find myself, um, I kind of gave myself my own mentors uh, from women who I admired from other generations, like just scouring and reading interviews and articles. And I would ask myself, oh, you know, what would Eartha Kitt do in this situation? Or what would someone, what would Lucille Ball? That's another one. I would like go read her, uh, try to find old interviews and that she gave to, to get insight on how she moved uh, in the business. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate that. Um, that was just a personal question of mine, but um, going back to Jezebel a little bit, uh, I like to talk a little bit more about like, because the story is so like autobiographical, uh, how did you like decide, like, how, like what would translate well to film, like from your own personal life experience? Um, and maybe like some things that you felt like, you know, didn't need to go in there. Like, how did you decide as like a director and actor and like sharing that experience with um, you know, your crew must also be like a very personal um, experience for you. So if you could talk a little bit about that. Um, yeah, it's a little bit of um, just what, what's always been really important to me. My first short film is called Judy and it's about my adoptive mother who had passed away. And it's a five minute film. It's on my website, House of Numa. <laughs> It's there under early works. But if you watch that film, that's the first film I ever made. Um, and you immediately will get the sense of how important it was for me to really work from memory and imagination, but heavily on memory to, to sort through the trauma and the grief that I went through um, in the last years of her life and her death. Um, and that's just, you know, in a five minute piece. So through that five minute film and showing it, I kind of did my own little tour with it and, you know, screened it for different, at, at different places and small festivals at the time. 
um, seeing that film come back to me and kind of going through the catharsis and the healing of that really just set me up for everything that I've done since then. So moving into a film like Jezebel, which also deals with my mother's death, um, but also deals with, you know, the choices that I made as a young woman to enter uh, sex work. Um, it's just a, it's just vital for me to continue to tell personal stories because I feel like it sheds light and brings understanding to misunderstood groups, um, especially Black women, especially Black women uh, who have had to make cer certain choices to survive um, and to just process the world that that we have to walk in in these bodies. And that's just something that will always really be important to me. But I think because I did it in my first film, I had the nerve to continue doing it. I knew what it was going to be like coming back at me. I, I was prepared for the emotional impact of that. I was prepared for all of the questions that would come at me about, well, you know, why, why was your life like this? And what happened to you? And, you know, all of the things that get <laughs> stimulated when you, when you make films that reflect your own life. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and a little bit about um, just a, a aspect of the film is definitely the sibling relationship um, between uh, with Tiffany uh, and Sabrina. Do you uh, how did, I mean, especially since it's different from like other coming of age stories in general. Mm -hmm. So how did you um, tap into like those unconventional themes and uh, yeah, if you could talk about that, the relationship. Yeah, I love to talk about that because that's central to me in the film, you know, and central to me in the messaging of talking about the film is that this is a love story between sisters, you know, and um it may not be the love story that you expected between sisters, but it very much is, you know, two sisters figuring out how to care for each other as they both were in a way coming of age, even though my sister, you know, was older and a mother already, she was still a very young woman at the time. Um, so, so yeah, the, the sister relationship from beginning to end, every single person who worked on the film needed to know and understand that and they did. So that was the main focus was to keep that relationship as honest and um, raw and stripped down as possible and to really have siblings. And even if you don't have a sibling, but I really wanted anyone who has a sister to relate to that because I remember in the early days of kind of pitching the film, uh, it was amazing how women with sisters <laughs> responded to just the idea of the film. And they would start talking about how, oh, wow, you know, uh, my sister is kind of like a second mother to me, or I, or I would tell my sister things I would never tell my mother. And, you know, my sister, you know, was there when I first started my period or whatever, you know, all of these very intimate things. I wanted to share the intimacy of that on screen. All right, I appreciate that. Um, Heather, do you have a question? I mean, she is just answering all, all of our, mm. our <laughs> it's so great because, you know, the follow-up to that we were really thinking about is, are those some of the personal stories? And, and it's incredible to me when you put yourself out there and you make this authentic story, you know, how that can impact people, you know, that are watching and touch mm -hmm. viewers' lives and have them process their own grief and their own issues. So I was, really interested in in how you know there's the critical reception and then there's the audience reception and the personal stories and and as a filmmaker like how does it feel um and, and what does the meaning change for you when when those people also share their vulnerability and talk about how Jezebel impacted them uh I mean I could just start crying thinking about it now you know the people that have come up to me um, after screenings, men as well, you know, and, and, and some of them have said to me, oh, you know, I'm a sex worker right now. And, you know, thank you so much for helping strip away some of the stigma around this and, you know, the choices that I've made. Um, I've had a, a, a couple come up to me and say, oh, we met online in this way on one of those type of sites and we're married now and it's like the best thing. 
Um, I had a guy come up to me and say, you know, I, that, that he didn't do sex work, but that he used to um, do some Ill illegal activities, <laughs> but he could really understand he could, you know, the fight to survive, you know, the, the fight to, you know, um, just make it and get out of the hole that you feel that, that you're in, you know, uh, what, what seems like might be a dismal future for you really turning that around. So it was really, really powerful, especially because then when the movie is over, I come up on stage and I'm like, hey, I'm a filmmaker now. This is what I do. These are the themes that that matter to me. Um, people look at that and say, "Oh, okay, that's that's interesting." You know, um, she is a survivor. She is this strong woman um, who has made art out of tough circumstances. So, yeah, yeah. It's it's um it's it's still very has quite an emotional impact on me still. Yeah, I mean, I think with with your directing, Numa, the thing that just always blows me away is just the authenticity to the narratives and the stories that you're telling. And it's it, it feels very intimate without being exploitative, which is such a fine line to walk. And I think it's why um, it's really wonderful to hear the story from a female's perspective, because so often we're seeing it through the lens of a man. Mm -hmm. um, and, and part of that authenticity for me was, was definitely your choice in casting. So I'd love to hear just more about that process and, and the decision, because the dynamic is just phenomenal um, between all of the characters, but again, especially between the sisters. And I love, I love the idea of, them sharing clothes and outfits for this job, but you better get your own PO box, you know, like there's yeah. something that would be so true to being a sibling. Yeah, just all the boundaries, you know, and all the, you know, a sister code of like, you can go this far, but not that far. Um, exactly. are definitely <laughs> in the film. <laughs> That's so funny. Uh, so a uh, Tiffany Tennille who plays Tiffany uh, and, and Jezebel in the film. I saw her first in a short film and uh, the film is called Roboto, directed by an amazing black woman, Erica Watson, a really beautiful story. And she, I watched that film because I was going to meet with Erica about something and I saw Tiffany in it and immediately I said, oh my God, that, that, that's that's the actress that she's gonna play me at 19. Like that's her, I, that's, you know, I just knew. Um, part of casting is just kind of having a nose and, a, and, a, and, and following your instincts on a person because that person could be someone who's never even acted before. Tiffany is a professionally trained, incredible actress but my nose said she's the one. And I didn't even meet her for another year or so. Um, and when we finally did meet, she had been uh, a viewer of the series that I did on Black and Sexy. So she was aware of my work. So that kind of helped. And then we found out that we have all of these things in common, um, even down to her name, because my adopted name is Tiffany. Um, our birthdays are only a few days apart. Uh, yeah, she's adopted as well, you know, it's just like so many things uh, were just, we just had in common, but I already could feel something in her acting presence, you know, in her, in her life force as a woman that said, yes, you know, she has the qualities that I'm looking for for this role. And she trusted me. And then we just worked on building that relationship as sisters so that it would, you know, she came with me on every run I had to make for the movie. She was very invested in it uh, right there with me. We had each other's backs and we're sisters to this day now. Like I was like, I created a younger sister for myself. <laughs> um, but the rest of the casting, half of them came from my acting class. So these were actors that I knew, we spoke the same language. I'd seen their growth and their work um, for years on the stage that we all played on together. Um, and then another, and a few others came in through auditions, but again, it was just, you know, viewing audition tapes and just having, having a nose, you know, them bringing their talent, of course, um, but just, 
knowing, you know, just following, following the instincts around that. And so, you know, an amazing cast was, was assembled in that way. I love that. Um, that's, that, I, and I, I think that goes more into like, like you found, like you took your personal story and found that in the cast and the crew. And I, I love that as well. Um, uh, but my next question is um, more like about like the cultural significance of your film, um, mm -hmm. because I do feel like they're definitely, even if like it was hard to see that while making the film, like I want to know, like, did you expect that? like Jezebel would like have such a cultural significance and like just f black filmmaking or filmmaking in general uh, in the years to come. Uh, and like, how did that cultural significance, uh, how does that change your filmmaking process like now, like the movies that's and so, the that's, you now? That's so interesting because I did not think about cultural impact at all in the making of the film. It was so like, I'm just burning to get this story told mm -hmm. um, and make my first feature so that people yeah. can like see, see what I'm about and see what I'm bringing to the table and, and see how I make a feature film. Um, I started to kind of see that in post-production when, when we, had a first rough cut of the film. I invited maybe 15, 20 people to look at that early cut and give feedback. And this was mostly close friends whose opinions you know, I trust in the industry. Um, so it wasn't you know like a sampling of the cultures so much as it was um, just wanting to get some honest feedback. But a lot of that was started to be echoed in the comments about the film there. And that's where I first started looking at it as being a, a contribution to the culture, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, in the, in the making of it, there, there, there was no goal to like be part of the canon because I just am, I guess, naturally because I'm a black woman. So not a conscious thing, but I see now how it is. You know, I see how it touches different communities in a really deep way. And, and I'm glad, I'm glad that it does, but it wasn't part of the plan. Yeah, and I, I think the reason I ask about that is just because like, I feel like, or this is maybe, I mean, I'm a young filmmaker, so this is what I'm viewing, but like, especially like black um, filmmakers, like there's like an expectation of what, you know, what movies you're type, um, you're, you're made, you can make. Uh, and in general, like, uh, like, what black representation looks like in media, especially for black women, mm -hmm. uh, there's an expectation of what that looks like. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why I think I was interested in uh, why, uh, or do you have a, re do you think about the cultural significance for, especially like black or young black um, creatives and stuff like that, like how, when there are um, limitations in Hollywood telling us, oh, black, people are supposed to look like this and black movies are supposed to look like this. How do you tell your work authentic, um, yeah. authentically? It's know, interesting like because it's something I've always bucked up against, you know, is, you know, the, the notion that, that we have to look or be or feel, you know, one way or one main way and that everything outside of that is very fringe. Um, on the other side of that, I've also kind of accepted that, that, I am a bit of a fringe artist and that doesn't mean I can't work in the mainstream, but I'm always trying to kind of unpack like, why is this mainstream and why is this fringe and why is this choice I made deemed unorthodox or unconventional, but this, but this choice is deemed, you know, classical filmmaking or the right way to do it, you know? And so it's interesting, like moving into the studio space now and working with a script that I didn't originate and kind of, you know, trying to blend, you know, my desire for that rawness and authenticity with like what a, what a studio, studio has, you know, mandated as part of their formula. Even though with Netflix, I feel like, you know, there is fluidity within that. And, you know, they're a great company for that, for that, you know, flexibility. I'm definitely now, you know, having to figure out how I'm gonna wade through those waters and what that's going to look like for me. Because with Jezebel, I made every choice that I wanted to make. You know, whether it like was, you know, like putting like lo little interstitials, dropping those, you know, throughout the film. You know, that's something that you see, you know, um, 
filmmakers do for sure. But when it comes to black people making films, it does feel like there is a formula that you're kind of expected to reach. Um, so yeah, so I'm just kind of, you know, looking at how to balance that out so that I'm doing my job, but also staying, you know, true, true to my artistry and my impulses. Um, because, you know, to me, th those impulses are something that's not even of you. It's just like part of your calling to follow through on. So, you know, I'm wading through those waters, but I've always, I've always bucked up against that. You know, you, you'll, <laughs> you'll see, you know, in all of my short films, you know, I don't think you'll find a, a trace of, um, a trace of formula in them, but you know, that's, you know, kind of up to you to decide, but yeah. Yeah, it's not, I, I love it's not like an uncommon. I feel like every artist feels that way, you know, like, okay, no one's going to tell me how to execute my art. You know, I'm an artist, you know, I'm not going to do it this way or whatever. Um, but I do think we have a, the extra bubble of that as a black artist. There is an extra bubble of that that you're always trying to shatter, you know, shatter that lens, whether it's a lens of morality, a lens of religion, you know, a lens of. Um, you know, what, what region of the country you're from as a Black American, you know, all of those things are, are always like right up in front of us with all of their expectations. So yeah, you just yeah. have to keep pushing through it. And that's, that's really inspiring. That's why I wanted to also ask, like, do you have any, um, I don't know, advice for young Black um, creatives that are, you know, how do we how, do, how are we unapologetically black in our filmmakings when there's that notion? Like, I know, like, mm -hmm. I love that you, you were able to like show that in your films, but do you have any, like, uh, I don't know, advice, piece of advice for, uh, advice for, I don't know, us? Well, if I look at my own work, the best advice that I can give is to start that early because you do create habits for yourself. So I did, I, in my first film, I was unapologetically me, which is a black woman raised yeah. in the United States with all of, um, with the, the culture of Haiti running very strongly <laughs> uh, through my blood at the same time. Um, who I've had the experiences that I've had. I've lived through the traumas I've lived through. I've had a like wild roller coaster of a life uh, so far. Um, though like much more like chill now for sure. But just, you know, as a child, like was crazy. Um, you know, being okay with showing those parts of myself and you know, how that, how that makes up the woman I am today. But starting with your first piece of art, you know, um, so that you set up that habit for yourself that whatever story you're telling, you're gonna, even if it's something out of your wildest imagination, something sci-fi that's not like, oh, this ha really happened to me when I was a kid, but really staying true to what comes through your mind, whether it's your memory or your imagination and doing that from your first film or your first poem you write or whatever it is you're doing, and setting up that habit for yourself because other influences will try to come in, whether it's your schooling or whatever, you will try to kind of come in and say, no, do it this way and try to kind of corral you. Um, and you're gonna be playing with that balance throughout your entire artistry and your entire career. So just start early, be bold from the start and let that, let that speak for itself, but let that be a muscle that you're working through all of your art. Wow, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, and I, I know we have limited time, so I, I don't know if we wanna jump into questions from the audience. Um, so I might we can, start off. Yes, if we have any. <laughs> hey, we got a couple people here. So um, this comes from, I'm sorry if I get the names wrong, Bridget Sweeney. Um, I am interested in what got Numa interested in directing and why she feels certain stories should or need to be told. Hey, Bridget. <laughs> so yeah, you know, I got interested in directing as a as a result of being a writer, an actor, and a person who loved photography. And I was experimenting with photography, which led me to cameras that could also film. <laughs> 
And then I wrote my first film and haven't looked back since, you know, I really fell in love with the process. I'm still, you know, very in love with all the aspects of the process. And for me, you know, it's become along the way when I, when I look back and really identify the themes that I've been drawn to, I'm able to articulate it now as, oh, it's about centering black women. It's about giving, um, bringing understanding to the misunderstood. But I was discovering that along the way, you know, I didn't just like show up and say, these are all the things that are important to me in, in making movies or creating art. Um, I discovered that along the way, but again, that was out of the love of all of those different aspects of the art all came together as a filmmaker. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that. Um, the next question comes from Ryan Quigley. I apologize if you got the name wrong. I feel in love with the character of Sabrina. She is so calm, cool, and collected as she faces incredible challenges. How much of the character is inspired from your own life? Uh, Ryan, thank you. <laughs> well, I, um, I'm playing my sister in the film. So, and my sister, uh, to make this all full circle, is the first person who gave me money for the film. She financed like the first third of the film. So it was this really full circle moment of us living that life together and then uh, partnering up to get this film made. Um, but as far as a character goes, I asked my sister permission to play her uh, mm -hmm. first. So I said, yeah, I gotta ask her permission. Is she okay with me playing her in the film? She said, yes. And I said, well, okay. I said, well, um, now I have to study you the way I would if I were playing any real person. So it just brought us so much closer together. We're closer than we've ever been now because not only did I have to study her for her mannerisms, like in the film, um, that calmness that you're talking about is very much her. That's not me. Like I talk with my hands and I'm this person. My sister is just like, boom, you know, ground, very grounded yeah. and, you know, definitely, you know, was the matriarch of, of, of our family at the time where I was, you know, kind of this like more uh, wild creature, I guess you could say. Um, and, and to this day, you know, I, I looked at speaking of mentors, you know, I still, you know, look to my sister to advise me on a lot of things. Um, but in the film, I had to study her voice, her cadence, her laugh, how she reacted emotionally to things is very different how I would. I never saw my sister cry, even, you know, um, when, you know, in the, in the hardest parts of the grief we were going through. All of that, I just had to study her and ask her questions that I would have never asked her before. And now we're so much closer because of it. Gotcha. Thank you for that. Uh... This is a good question from Keisha G. There was so much raw emotion in the last scene of the film, particularly with you and Tiffany's character. How did you, how did you to fully prepare for that scene? Also, can we expect a part two, which is an interesting question. Wait, what's the part? Oh, is there a part two to the a film? Part two. <laughs> okay, so um, the way we prepared those, all of those bathroom scenes were very pivotal. And I expressed that to Tiffany, but also my director of photography, um, Brent Johnson, that I remember when, first of all, we shot in the same apartment that we used to live in. So that tiny, tiny apartment, it's not the same wow. unit, but it's the same building. All of those apartments are the same. When my crew arrived, they couldn't believe how small it was. My cinematographer said, how am I even gonna find new angles to yeah. show in this place? And I said, I tried to tell you guys, this is how I was living, you know? Yeah. And so I'm playing my sister um, and my daughter is in the film. So we are spending every night in that apartment so I can sink, I'm sinking even more into the memories. I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm sleeping here. Um, so I'm really feeling like I have gone back in time. Tiffany's also, you know, preparing her work. And so when we both come to the scene, we're full, you know, I'm also directing, but I'm keeping my costume on in between. I remember, you know, like uh, Sabrina's wearing this white bra throughout the film and I would be directing in that white bra because it was so hot in Las Vegas. 
And so I was always, you know, very close to the um, the character, even when while I was directing, I was able to slip mm-hmm. back and forth. So a lot of our preparation um, was before we even ar- arrived, you know, just all of the all of the character work we did, all of the time that we spent together to really become intimate in our real life, you know, as close as we can so that that you can feel that off the screen. These are not two strangers jumping into a scene together. We built the relationship and then we just let it fly. We let it fly mm-hmm. in the moment. And that that scene is the last scene that we filmed in Las Vegas. So we had had all of the scenes that we did together up until then. We we had that memory that even, you know, the memory of filming, like the memory of life was right there with us. Yeah. And we just trusted each other and let it fly. Oh, and is there a part two? You know, uh, we'll see. <laughs> um, there's been a lot of talk about it, a potential series um, or a potential sequel, but I'm a little bit wrestling with it now because in one way I'd like to do it. And in the other way, I feel like I'm really committed to that ending. I'm really committed to the question mark of, you know, um, what happens to this woman, even though you can see what happened to me. Um, But, you know, a lot of people have definitely asked or been frustrated with the ending. So I I have thought about it. We'll see. (laughs) Thank you. Uh, I think we can take a couple more questions. Uh, BFA Films and Entertainment asks, how did you approach the type of camera and look for Jezebel? Oh, nice. Thank you. I love this question. Yeah. (laughs) So my cinematographer, Brent Johnson, I had worked with him on many episodes for Black and Sexy TV, you know, that I directed or produced, you know, but always, you know, worked very closely with him. So we had a shorthand um, and I shared a lot of references with him. There are two references for Jezebel that I'll share with you uh, that may or may not come as a surprise. One is Purple Rain. Uh, Mm. I wanted that just like those gorgeous colors and the sensuality and kind of like the eroticism of those colors for all of the chat scenes. So I shared that film. Um, And Raising Victor Vargas, uh, which a lot of that film takes place in a small apartment in Brooklyn, small sweaty apartment with a family just trying to cope. And there's a lot of movement and there's a lot of natural light, you know, at least seemingly, um, you know, dealing with the available light, dealing with the available shadows. All of that was really important to me, really important to mark the contrast between that shadowy apartment where we experienced so much grief and frustration to the chat room where she could escape all of that and find herself, you know, and and explore herself and learn this new world and this new life. I wanted those two things to be very starkly different. Um, and those were the references for both. Wow. Oh, that's interesting. I, I didn't even think about that. That's, <laughs> I love that cool. question. I don't get to answer it. It's not asked often. So thank yeah. you. <laughs> uh, well, we have a follow up to that question. So in regards to the making of Jezebel and other projects, what about the crew? Do you think it is important to have as much diversity behind the, the scenes as you do on, in front of the screen? Absolutely. I mean, yes. <laughs> uh, you got to find your tribe. You got to find who moves with your sensibility. And um, it's important to still, you know, stretch yourself in that area and not only stop at, (laughs) you know, what's immediately familiar to you, but I'm really speaking to people who don't look like me, (laughs) you know, um, they're the ones that need to be told that more to kind of, you know, stretch to find their teams in that way. Um, But for me, it was really vital in the editing process. So our lead editor is a black woman named Brittany Lyles. And she did a lot of editing for Black and Sexy TV, had never edited a feature before, but I loved her sensibility. I loved that um, she was very open and non-judgmental. Like I knew she wasn't gonna be prude with any of the footage, you know? And I knew that she would have just a certain eye on it. And I reached out to her and said, I know you have never edited a feature before, but you do such great work. And um, you're so creative and I love your approach. 
I just gave her footage. I did give her notes, but I let her do, I let her have a lot of creativity in that before I, I came in to continue sculpting and carving with her. But it was really important for me to have a black woman piecing the film together. Um, my, cinemat my cinematographer is a white man, <laughs> but there's also um, something that felt important to me about that, especially in the chat room scenes because a lot of those men that were gazing upon me were white men. And I did want the lens to reflect that. And those are kind of the subtle things that you almost can't quantify or describe why it's different and why it feels different. Just like, you know, if you have a black cinematographer, you, you feel something different, you know, than we have, and you can't really describe what it is, but for those chat room scenes, I wanted it to feel like the white man's gaze, <laughs> you know, um, and I wanted it to be beautiful and all of the beautiful things that, that Brent brings to that. Um, but I also wanted it to have that kind of unspeakable tone to yeah. it. Thank you for that. Um, that's all the questions that I have. Um, so thank you for you know this moment. Um, Heather, if you want to close this out. I, well, I had one more, I had one more <laughs> question for Numa, just because you're talking about the process and, and so many of our film students at UConn are beginning their careers and, and they're looking at doing short form content. And I mean, I know Isaiah just shot a short and for so many filmmakers like you, their favorite part in the process is being on set and just feeling that unbelievable energy that you get from the cast and the crew and the live performances. And then when you get into the editing room, it can just sometimes be so deflating because mm. now it's, it's on this small screen and you're having to rework it and you've had this image in your mind of what the movie should be. Um, did you find that that was the case at all for you? And um, how did work with your post team kind of help alleviate that feeling that a lot of filmmakers have? Well, I love the editing process. So I love sitting in the editing bay next to my person and, you know, going through everything. And it's definitely a long and tedious process that requires patience. And it's not like, you know, I don't necessarily want to sit there for the that first rough assembly of it. Like, I'm like, you, can, you know, here's the general notes, here's the script, you know, start laying some things out and then I'll come in and then, you know, we'll, we'll go from there. So I understand that. Um, it's also definitely a test of your endurance and belief because it's kind of a, all a mess at first, you know, and even those like very first super rough cuts that you would never show anyone else. If you don't really understand the patience of that to get to the end, you could become very disillusioned. And I definitely went through that a few times. Like things came back to me and I'm like, okay, do we even have a movie? Do we, like, I don't think we do. I just think that, wow, you know, this is, um, yeah, I don't even know how we're gonna like get to the next thing, but it would be like interrupting, I don't know, a sculptor when they're, you know, just, just got like this mass of clay and they can see it, or maybe they can't totally see it. So you're a little bit feeling in the dark, but you can't just look at that clump of clay and just say, oh, it's never gonna become, you know, whatever, you know, the Rodin or whatever. <laughs> you have to, you have to, you know, really believe in yourself to get to the other side of it. But I actually really do love the majority of that process. Um, and I definitely learned in a feature film that those anxieties are a hundred times more because you've got, you know, almost two hours, <laughs> you, you, you have to have something that really is gonna sustain at least 90 minutes and um, it can feel rough, but that's part of the ride. So just expect that going in and stick it, stick through it, keep trying different things, um, move, switch a scene that you thought was gonna come first, change, put the beginning in the end, just keep trying different things and get yourself an editor or be the editor that's willing to flip your script inside out. You know, maybe your film doesn't work, doesn't work as the script laid it out, but it completely works. If you just move a few things around, take some things out, you just have to keep playing with it. Thank you.
<laughs> this conversation, Numa, I cannot um, express my gratitude. I wish I could be, give you a big giant hug. This has been oh, big hugs. <laughs> <laughs> love on YouTube. We've had tons of wonderful comments about people being inspired and just totally excited about what's happening. So um, I, I can feel the energy right here through, through this. Good. Um, good, good, thank good. you so much to, to Isaiah. So proud of you, Nikki. Thank you so much. Um, I do want to do a few acknowledgements and announce what we've got happening because this was the first event and oh my gosh, how do we're going to follow this up? I don't know. <laughs> but we've got four more events today. So that's first what we all, do, that's what we do, you know. <laughs> um, we'd also like to acknowledge our partners for the, in this event. We've got the Jorgensen Center for the Performing Arts and H. Fred Simmons African American Cultural Center. We're going to put some links in there for you in the chat box. Um, check out the upcoming spring events at the Jorgensen at uh, jorgensen.ucon.edu and at the AACC at aacc.ucon.edu. And we would want to invite everyone out there to come to the remainder of our Amplifying Black Voices in Hollywood event. We've got 2.30 today. We have Kristen Marston, who's the Culture and Entertainment Advocacy Director at Color of Change Hollywood, who is going to be delivering Reforming Hollywood's Writer's Room, How the TV Crime Genre Normalizes Injustice. Ooh. Then at four o'clock, we've got Chris White, who's a visual effects supervisor at Weta Digital in New Zealand for Diversity Matters, the value of inclusion in visual effects. 5.30, we've got Alana Mayo, president of Orion Pictures for challenging the status quo, authentic storytelling at the studio level. And finally, our keynote, uh, keynote event at seven o'clock tonight, we will welcome actor, director, Ramani Malko to talk about his film, Tijuana, Jackson, Purpose Over Prison in the final event, Fighting for Equity in Hollywood, Leveraging Film as a Conduit for Change. Um, the rest of the spring series, primarily uh, on Fridays, we're gonna have a rich lineup for the remainder of, of, the, ses of the spring. Um, next Monday, we have uh, seven o'clock, Dr. Aliyah Brown to present Black Rhizomes, a digital public history practice. And uh, be sure to check out uh, dmd.ucon.edu slash diverse uh, to see the full image and follow us on YouTube. Um, thanks to all the wizards and organizers behind the scenes. Uh, we've got Nikki Justice, Stacey Webb, uh, Michael Toomey, who's running tech, the Jorgensen staff, our student marketing team, especially our graduate assistant, Matthew Mullen, who's created the logo for the event and everybody who worked together to produce it. And most of all, thanks to all of you out there in the virtual audience for joining us today. We had um, 75 viewers from around the country. Uh, I hope that all of you are as inspired as we are about the future of the industry. Um, and what we can do to make this change. There's a lot of work to be done, but if we continue it to inspire and mentor our young creatives, we are gonna change this industry for the better. So thank you, stay safe, wear a mask, have a great weekend. Bye. Bye. Numa, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, thank you for having me. Of course. Bye.